so let's just get on with it. Because it's not true. We know that there are countries that are much better at governing, at harnessing globalization, at not only leveraging its positive ingredients, but also at fighting to ensure that we don't have small winners and lots of losers. I think one very fundamental uh, message that you will hear next week, and I hope it's a message that again is not, uh, as the Prime Minister is saying, is not just a message that we all sing, but also what we do at home, is multilateralism, the importance of international cooperation. All these issues that I have described are issues that escape, cannot be governed by just one country, not even by two powerful as they are. It needs international cooperation. And what worries me is that I hear too much of this painting international cooperation as if it was for the weak, as if it was for the naive. You know, big, the guys, they don't go for multilateralism. They go for their countries first. And putting your country first requires today putting international cooperation first, because this is what will give you the most efficient solution to all these difficulties that we're facing. So, uh, sorry to take a bit of a winding road, but it's not issues, it's the method that we will take to address those issues that matters. But, but if I could just touch on the issue of the international cooperation, from my viewpoint, what is happening is the platform that we've been operating on is changing. And there are a number of factors that are disturbing the platform in a new way. And I feel that something like technology, the fact that I can express an opinion and it can go all around the world, I think it will make a difference in international cooperation because when we sit as politicians in all those arenas, making decisions and taking positions and negotiating, very often, sometimes, it has no reference to the person on the ground back home that we are representing. And they don't pay attention to what we're saying. I'm saying that technology will allow the people of the world to begin to engage all of those issues, begin to recognize that they can have an opinion and that they need to express that opinion and make sure that we represent that opinion when we go to do international cooperation. And I think that this will go a long way to changing what happens in the international arena when people understand what is being done in their name. I think that this will help tremendously. The question is, how are we going to mobilize the ordinary man and woman to engage all of those issues and understand what they mean for them? That's why I appreciate what we are looking at doing in Barbados in terms of changing education, in terms of being able to create a different citizen, a citizen who now begins to understand his or her interests. And I think that if we can make that happen, I think that we will see the face of international cooperation changing because people will begin to engage it and push it in specific directions. Please, Ambassador Mathurin, I know you wanted to jump in. <clears throat> well, we've, the conversation has moved to looking at technology. And I, I, want to, I want to be a little parochial here in the sense that I work on trade policy issues. And I'm watching my region grapple with whether it should be party to the development of a regime which speaks to how we can harness that technology to improve um, our trading conditions, to incorporate our young people in a, in a really meaningful way. It is our young people who have mastered certainly the information um, technology. And I'm watching some of our uh, leadership within the region, and I'm not speaking of leadership here tonight, it's present here tonight, grappling with whether we should be participating in the development of this regime. I'm speaking specifically about discussions which are taking place in the World Trade Organization, and I agree with Arantxa that multilateralism is absolutely important, despite all of the, the, the turmoil around the concept, the turmoil that, that is happening within key institutions, etc. The fact is that small countries, there really is no other, no other avenue for us um, if we're to hear our views and get them um, accepted 
and and to to participate in the in the in whatever global governance system is taking place. I'm talking specifically about what's happening with regard to electronic commerce. Now, interestingly enough, our framers, the framers of our revised Treaty of Shagaramas, which sets up the CARICOM single market and economy. And this treaty was written, I think, in, was finalized in the late 1990s, early 2000s, were visionary. They made provision for the establishment of a regional e-commerce regime at a time when the technology really had not exploded in the way that it has now and did not show the potential and the opportunities that it now does. Unfortunately, we haven't got very far with that. But I am confident that under the leadership of Prime Minister Motley, as the lead Prime Minister um, in CARICOM on the CSME, we will make progress there. But the question is, should we wait on what we do in the region before we participate with the glo in the global system that is now looking at how you can fashion that regime? When I think of the opportunities that the, uh, that the digital world can provide for small countries, for small entrepreneurs. Um, I know that Minister, Minister Husbands feels very strongly about the development of micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises. When I think about the opportunities that that kind of regime can provide for those producers, when I look at the state, when I look at our economic prognosis, some of you may have heard what the Cent uh, Caribbean Development Bank said, I think it was last week, it was a most depressing prognosis and predicted that if we don't arrest current trends, we could be the poorest um, regional grouping in the world in, by 2050. So we got to, we've got to, we've got to, to, to let me say, get up off of our... we got to get real, right? Um, and so I just wanted to make that link. There are things happening in relation to technology, in relation to moving our economies to another level, and we're still talking about it. If, if I can just come in. I love Gail, the free flow, Gail, please. Because she's absolutely correct. And the truth is the Caribbean cannot opt out of the global discussions on e-commerce at the WTO. But at the same time, we need to get ourselves off of our seats. I'd be a little more diplomatic coming after her. And settle what we need to settle because the truth is a lot of it is already within our environment and just needs harnessing. Now we can come together for all other kinds of things and we do it fast. But this which will affect our vital economic interests in the next few decades, this is where our students are telling us they want to go. We look today at the Barbados Youth Advance Corps again. What did we do? They brought to me a set of subjects that I told them was a rinse-off from the 20th century. No, I'm not dealing with a rinse-off from the 20th century. So go back and come back in two weeks and bring me, in addition to the things that we need to do to harness citizenship and, and, and that sensitivity to be the kind of Barbadian that we want, also bring me the exposure and training that locates them fully in the third decade of the 21st century. Now that's going to mean dealing with artificial intelligence, dealing with robotics, dealing with um, all other kinds of coding and all of other kinds of things, dealing with understanding that to live in these countries, as we said two weeks ago, we have to change how we build. You go to the Bahamas, what did they tell you? The countries that were on stilts were least affected. Why? Because ironically, even as we prepare for the 21st century, we need to hearken back so a few things, that we had a population before us, ancestors before us, who did not have the luxury of getting ready because there was no technology to advise them. So they had to be ready instead of getting ready. And therefore, we need to rethink a lot of the things that we are doing. And that's why I like Arantxa's expression in her opening remarks in the book framing it in the three revolutions, because those three revolutions are changing literally that simple word, how, how we do almost everything. And in my view, the region has to settle on a single domestic space in telecommunications, 
it has to settle on what are the key aspects of electronic commerce um, that we need to, and quite frankly, we, we ought not to have any boundaries at all within the CSME at all as it comes to the whole issue of electronic commerce and regulation. Because what is happening is that we are being taken advantage of by large multinational entities who are dealing with separate small little entities. So I said to Giselle yesterday, they said, oh, we want a single domestic space and a hurry in telecoms. And they said, oh, well, it's a complex. I said, complex? Open this. Where is this resident? They say, how oh, do you mean, where is it resident? Prime Minister, it's in your hand. I said, where is the phone resident? Barbados, I said, no, it isn't. When I pick up this phone, it locates me as Jamaica. Now, if you have a switch in Jamaica that is operating Barbados, then you can't tell me that it is a problem to fix and create a single domestic space in telecoms and to remove roaming and to remove all of those other things that increase the cost of doing business in the digital world. Okay? But it's a matter of perspective because equally we look at CBC and we want to call CBC a television station. CBC is not a television station. CBC is a digital platform. And either CBC will carry us where the other telecoms are not carrying us, or the other telecoms will carry us because they have more capital than CBC. But one way or the other, CBC is going to be influential in influencing what kind of technology we expose to our people and enforcing the issue of unraveling the complexity that they want to mire regulation in. And if we don't deal with it in the context of e-commerce and in context of the digital platform, we are going to be left behind. Um, inclusion in Africa, and Gozi says it in her chapter, comes as a result of what that fourth revolution, industrial revolution, is going to bring to them. We had President Kenyatta here. We all know of the power of mobile money and mobile phones in terms of inclusion in Africa. We know it. So what is it that's stopping it? Let's start. You cannot have a Caribbean community that meets twice a year of heads of government and then tell me you want to function in a single market and single economy. Around how often do European heads meet now? Almost every other week or every three weeks. Now with, uh, now with Brexit, almost every day. <laughs> Let's close that chapter. <laughs> you understand? At, at least once a month. That's of the course. point. Of course. And we are closer to them, smaller than them, but we want to believe that we are so important that we have to focus on a national boundary when we know that we cannot produce enough goods and services within our national boundaries to survive or to transition or even to confront what we're confronting with, with climate change and open economy and the Prime threats Minister. from the European Union. Prime Minister, I cannot because I'm from St. Lucia and I travel once a month to go home. There's a little matter of the cost of travel. <laughs> I could not. <laughs> I could not give up the opportunity to talk about that. No, I, I, I am glad you raised it because the companion Please. to the single domestic space in telecoms is the single domestic space to facilitate movement. Now, let's get real. I, I, and I've been very, very muted because I don't believe in, in shouting across the Caribbean seas. But I also don't believe that you can look at something started in 1974 and believe that it is appropriate to the functioning of 2019, 2020. Now at the same time, we have a unique opportunity that we need to work on. Trinidad and Tobago, for example, has shown what is possible with maritime transport and how you can create a sea bridge such that in 15, 20 years, the number of people moving between Trinidad and Tobago is in excess of 1.2 million people a year. Now, 1.2 million is the population of Trinidad. Tobago only has 60,000 people. So how you have so much people moving between them two islands? Because you have created new classes of travelers in congregations, in schools, in sporting teams, in people who want cheaper hardware costs, in people who want cheaper groceries. And if we therefore can invest, and this is what we're working on, but if we can invest 
in a project, a model project, that creates a sea bridge between those islands in the southern Caribbean that can move cargo and reduce cargo costs such that all of a sudden people farming in Trinidad or St. Lucia or St. Vincent or Grenada or Barbados can now all of a sudden see the full market on a daily basis as their market because the cargo, um, the container trucks, it can hold 40, 40 foot container trucks. You can carry 200 cars. So you move in and move on and you're mutually recognized in terms of insurance and licensing, etc. So you can move between the countries and then a thousand passengers a day. Now, whatever else we do with air transport, because there will always be people like you who might want to move fast to St. Lucia to a meeting. But there are others who might, in a congregation or a sporting team or cargo, prepare to take the four or five hours of a sea bridge. And until we solve the problem of telecommunications, transport, and also information flows. Now, in fairness, CARICOM has been trying to do it, which is where we put the procurement um, portal up so that people can start to begin to bid on other projects in other islands. But we still don't have real-time information on our broadcasting stations. So I can go and watch what's happening in Iowa, I keep saying. I don't know what the hell is happening in St. George's, Grenada. I don't know what's happening in Kingston. And until we deal with those three things, we're making mock sport. Telecommunications, transportation, Travel. and communication. And I hope no country is an island. And Gail started by saying that as a superheroine, she wants the powers of persuasion. I go back there because ultimately, those powers of persuasion are necessary. I asked, answered you by saying, I want to, to listen to the people and to use our people to put pressure on sovereign entities. People cannot replace governments. They can. In the international community, the multilateral system requires sovereign states to take decisions. But people influence governments, and people determine what governments do. And that's where we need to have a more effective game. And I, I want us to listen to the people soon. So we're going to come to you with some questions. I, I know we probably maybe, I don't know how much time I could trespass on of the esteemed panelists, but I would say another 50, maybe 20 minutes. I didn't get to direct my specific questions to Ambassador and Minister. I think, Ambassador, Minister, you wanted to say something, but maybe you could roll it into my question. Um, so I did a little research on you. And I saw that you described as your most significant accomplishment of your life, the transformation of the Small Business Association in Barbados. And you've done a lot of work transforming the business sector. But now you're a minister of trade. And I want to see how these two things begin to converge in terms of the movements you can make in using the international space whether it's the negotiations in Geneva or the discussions here in CARICOM to promote the small business, the small and medium-sized economy. In fact, the micro and small medium-sized economies that most CARICOM businesses probably are. Um, so that is something that the international space, and I know the ITC is doing a lot of work in, but in terms of the formulation of rules, we're at a critical point in the WTO right now where one of the discussions, and I have Ambassador Blackman here, one of the discussions is where do we move in terms of thinking about carving new rules for SMEs? I wonder if you had any thoughts, having your own experience working now as a minister in the Ministry of Trade, how do we make sure that we use the international space to promote the small businesses in the Caribbean? I think it flows from out of what uh, Prime Minister was just saying, um, because at CARICOM they're trying to lay the platforms that allow for trade to take place. The challenge that we have with our small enterprises is the fact that if you don't get the Caribbean people to buy in to the CSME, if we don't deepen our regional integration, Prime Minister spoke about the fact that we don't have information about what is happening next door. The other problem that we have is where you have your big suppliers, for example, who when they're looking for goods to put on the shelves to sell to 
West Indian people. They're buying them from um, the United States. They're buying them from Europe. They're not looking at the region as a place from which to get product to sell to the people of the region. And when you couple that with what television has done in terms of giving our people a taste for other people's creativity and innovation, but no appreciation of their own, then you will not get the development of your small and medium enterprises. I used to tell some of my workshops this simple thing, that years now we should have had cassava porn available in a disposable container, in a supermarket, uh, freezer, that anybody can take it up any part of the world. Peas and rice should have been in a can. Okra slush should have been available, should, have been, should be manufactured. But at the bottom of that problem is our appreciation of ourselves, who we are, what we produce. We tend to be ashamed of what we're creating. You know how long it took for Barbadians to value fish cakes? Fish cakes was poor people food. Barbadians didn't, you know, it was like, mm. but now you can't take fish cakes anywhere and Barbadians don't long after it. So part of the issue is that we have to help the population to change their thinking and you have to help your businesses to change the thinking that unless it comes from overseas over and away in a developed country that it is not good. That's the first one. The second problem that we have is that we need to release properly the potential of our people. And this means releasing the potential of women. There is no country that can be strong and maximize itself without being able to release the power of their women in their community. That is absolutely vital. If we don't change some of the social systems that make it difficult for women to engage, to be able to go after their dreams, to pursue trade. When I talk with women who want to start a business, why do you want to start a business? I need to make some extra money. Well, what do you want to do? And they come up with things that are governed by how it will affect the children, how much time I have, and so on and so forth. So they're very often not doing something that they really want to do. They're doing something that the, the, the cramp confines of their space allows them to do while carrying so many different loads. Up to yesterday, I had a chat with a young woman, and she is a manager at a significant institution, but she wants to be an entrepreneur. She wants to be able to, to, to package certain things. I won't say what it is, because she think I'm talking about her business. But she cannot take the time to take the business, to follow her heart and take the business where she needs to, because she's got to keep her job. Now, if we don't bring some change to how the economic and social system works to give the support to women that they can get out and really begin to drive entrepreneurship, you're not going to get the full release of the potential of our people. And one other point that I, I, I want to make, because it was an astonishing fact for me when I saw it, that they said that women control $4 trillion of wealth and assets in the world. And that absolutely stunned me. And I said to myself, what if women got up and leveraged that power to begin to change the conditions of trade, change the economic systems, start to leverage that power to say that I will not buy from a firm that does this to their human resource, or that does this to the planet, or engages in unfair trade so that Mexican farmers get 10 cents for their coffee, and the person who makes the coffee and, and markets it and sells it, they'll sell at $15 a pound. But we are locked into our own little world with heavy agendas that take up a lot of our time that really does not allow us to engage the wider space in the way that we can and bring to the world the solutions. Because one of the things about women, women tend to be fair. Women tend to be inclusive.
Women tend to want everybody to have the opportunity to play and to succeed. And I believe that if we can find a way to release women, we can make a very big difference to the economic outcomes of our region. And education is where it's at. We've got to change at the educational level to create the release that we're looking for in the future. Thank you so much. <laughs> Ambassador, Ambassador, you will, I hope, incorporate your comments into my just very brief introduction of you. Um, so, Ambassador, you are the last man, woman to the crease. I know you are a big cricket fan. I thought I would put in that little metaphor. Oh, we're so fortunate to have you here, and I know you would love to be watching that match. So I remember when I first met, well, it wasn't the first time I met you, but I remember you when I had gone to Geneva, and at the time you were the ambassador representing Jamaica to the WTO and other UN agencies, and you cut a very fine figure in Geneva, you know, elegant, walking through the corridors and your silver fox look. Um, and I remember thinking at the time, you know, what, what must the responsibility of articulating the position of a, a country of CARICOM be for somebody as yourself and all other ambassadors that we have here and persons who work in the missions? And that gave you quite an important and interesting view, looking at how the Caribbean manages itself in the broader international framework. And then you left and came back to the Caribbean, which gives you another perch from which to observe Caribbean internal dynamics of trade. And this is the question I have for you. Being privy to, these both, to both of these worlds, the Caribbean and the regional and the international, and seeing right now the threat that the WTO is under, especially from regional subgrouping efforts, including the African continental free trade area, which is going to be, if it's successfully, well, it's been signed, it's going to amalgamate the economies of 50 or more states in Africa. My question is to you with your bird's eye vision, is there still a role, and I've, I've heard everybody talk about multilateralism still being the future, but where does regionalism and working among and within your regions, where does that fit in now in terms of its place in an international forum that's becoming increasingly difficult to sustain because it's under so much threat? That is a mouthful, Janiv. <laughs> uh, <laughs> let me first of all try and deal with, well, let me backtrack a bit. First of all, I just want to say that I think the representatives of CARICOM who serve overseas um, carry the flags of our region extremely high. Um, I've, I've, I, I, really, I really would like to say that. It's not in self-interest. Yes, I was part of that grouping once, but I think if we look at Caribbean representation overseas over the decades, uh, we have great reason to be proud because our representatives in many, many fora, not just the WTO, not just in Geneva, have put the issues of concern to the Caribbean on various tables, they've put them on various agendas. Now, where we've gone with them is another matter for debate, but I think we've, we've, we, I think we've been well represented over the years and we continue to be well represented. The question of regionalism versus multilateralism, I really don't think there is an issue. I think that there's always going to be uh, an impetus which drive countries to coalesce at the regional level. It's natural, um, it's, it's almost familial. That's why I think we have CARICOM, for example. 
um, despite our issues from time to time, the fact is that we are at the end of it, at the bottom of it. We're all family. And we all have similar origins, similar histories. Um, similarly with Africa. The, look at the European Union. The European Union is probably the most successful regional integration arrangement in the world. It is also a major player in the multilateral system, whether it be in the WTO, whether it be the United Nations. Um, so I don't necessarily think that the two are incompatible at all. From a CARICOM perspective, I think that our regional process, our regional movement, in fact, has great potential. It has done it already, but it has even more potential to facilitate how we profile at the multilateral level. Because what certainly our regional mechanisms allow us to do is that on many issues, and uh, far more than I think CARICOM is given credit for, um, we go as one voice into a, into a multilateral setting. And it, it carries weight. It's not by accident that every time our foreign ministers meet or when our heads of government meet, we get requests from a number of countries who want to meet with them while they are meeting uh, in the Caribbean, dealing with CARICOM issues, to lobby them because we've got votes in, one, in some one or another uh, multilateral organization. Um, and, it, and in fact, I know, I believe um, Prime Minister Motley is going to head Barbados delegation to United Nations General Assembly next week. I am aware that the program for the CARICOM Prime Ministers and delegations um, is horrendous because there are so many other players in the multilateral system who want to meet with our leaders. Um, and I, I suggest that the strength, the, the, the one of the attractions that we have is precisely because we are a regional unit. We are a regional organization, we are a regional movement. As I said, we can criticize what we should have done, what we don't do, what issues we have difficulty with, but at the end of the day, that's how we present ourselves. So I really, I really don't necessarily see regional movements, regional trading arrangements, regional political arrangements as being detrimental to the multilateral system. If I could just make one comment on what, um, on what Minister <laughs> was, was talking about, particularly with regard to, to, to small and medium-sized businesses. And let, me, and let me get gender specific here because I was, I was looking at some, some data. There's unfortunately very little data about how many women-owned firms in the Caribbean are involved in the export industry. I think Caribbean export has done some, has attempted to do some work in identifying them and more than identifying them in seeing how they can, how the institution Caribbean export can help in helping them to get to market. Um, and one of the programs and Arantia in another life was a part of the European Commission um, one of the programs that I think we, 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 we has a great deal of potential and, may, and that we might want to find ways of replicating and expanding is a program which is targeted at female entrepreneurs, female exporters in this region to help them uh, f from a financial perspective um, in terms of improving their profile improving the way in which they can export their goods. It's, it's, it's that kind of hands-on um, arrangement, that, those kinds of measures that I think will unleash the potential that you, Minister, have spoken about. I just wanted to throw that out as one very concrete example of what we are doing in the region. Um, as I said, we may need to look at ways in which we can expand it but um, it's, it's a start. If I can, just very quickly, because the real, and here is absolutely correct, but the real issue 
There's also access to financing. Uh, and we have a situation now where our traditional banking institutions are not taking a chance on our people. And the bottom line is, the bottom line is that we, for example, in Barbados have over $9 billion in liquidity in, um, in our savings system. Now, I can go country by country by country by country in the region and find the same situation. And what is it as well? That you're paying people 0.1%. In fact, we are paying banks to keep our money in the banks when you take the bank charges into account. And it is one of the reasons why our government took the very risky step, but critical step, of placing $10 million a year into the trust loan programs in order to be able to help nano enterprises, the real small, small, small people that when they go to knock at a bank door, or even sometimes the credit union, people ask you, who are you? So if we can afford to give people fiscal incentives who come here to do business, we can afford to put money behind small people in our country to fund them an enterprise. But it needs us to go further. And therefore, our ability within the context of the single market and the single economy to create the financial instruments, both at the higher level where we look, because the real issue in the CSME is going to come between the conversation between the MDCs and the LDCs on Chapter 7 of the treaty with respect to how do we deal with the fact that in a single market and a single economy, there are going to be winners and they're going to be losers. And therefore, there has to be some kind of rebalancing mechanism. And we saw that as the Regional Development Fund. Problem is, is that the very countries who ought to perhaps be carrying more weight in the context of the Regional Development Fund are themselves facing serious difficulties. But we have to stop being binary in our approaches. And we need to think outside the box again and go back to the citizenry again. Because the citizens of the region have almost 50 billion US dollars in savings within the countries of the CSME. So that doesn't include Bahamas, okay? In that 50 billion US dollars, we need to begin to float instruments that allow people who are constituted or who may be described as a disadvantaged company, a disadvantaged sector, even a disadvantaged country, to be able, therefore, to have access to those funds. Because if we can float growth and resilience bonds within the context of CARICOM, that may give you a return at 3% or 2.5%. That is multiple times more than you're getting from your commercial bank now or even your credit union. But equally, the cost of capital to the country or to the sector or to the region that is disadvantaged or to the company that's disadvantaged is all of a sudden affordable. Now, will everybody do it? Of course not. But can we probably find about 5% of that savings going into these instruments? Probably. And 5% represents 2.5 billion US dollars. Now, 2.5 billion US dollars represents 50% of the GDP of Barbados alone. So, all I'm saying is, is that we have to think outside of the box and take control, particularly since, in addition to the financing issues and access to financing, we are going to have it complicated by the implications of de risking and um, correspondent banking issues that we are facing in the region. Although, we have to ask ourselves whether we're not playing into people's hands sometimes rather than taking control of our regulatory environment and making the best of it, and also then making the case as a result of it. But that access to financing is the oxygen for those nano and small um, and medium-sized enterprises, and we're not necessarily addressing it at the regional level, in my view, as effectively as we can because it's not just simply a parochial national issue. I want to, uh, I want if, uh, Janiv, if I may, on this, uh, because I fully agree with you. And what's more, if banks, if traditional financial institutions do not serve this category of customers, someone else will do and will eat their cake. <laughs> so uh, watch out, uh, because if financial institutions don't uh, play their role 
of uh, ensuring the transmission belt uh, between resources and customers, I can see many, many other players coming into the market and replacing them. Second, on the regulatory front, listening to, uh, uh, listening to uh, uh, Gail uh, talk about uh, the non-participation of the Caribbean in the ongoing discussions on electronic commerce, makes me think of what's happening, uh, what's happened already uh, with the banking regulation. When you are not seated at the table, someone sets the rules. Right. And the rules would be set without your sensitivities. Right. Now, e-commerce today is about what? Is about the privacy of data. Yep. That will be the discussion. This is the frontier in the discussions on electronic commerce. So the question is which regime will prevail? Would it be the Chinese one, where, to cut a long story short, essentially data is in the hands of the government? Will it be the European model, where essentially data is in the hands of the citizen? Or will it be the American model, where essentially the data is in the hands of business? It matters a lot, because at the end of the day, if you're not seated at the table, it certainly will not be your system. Another, um, sorry. Another piece to that puzzle is, and Prime Minister started to touch on it in terms of if you don't have data and research, your trade cannot grow. For example, at Cortez, we, when, when we are doing the Cortez meetings, we get suspensions for um, guava puree, banana puree, and all kinds of things, things that we could actually grow in the region instead of giving a suspension and having to import it. So what I, what I feel strongly about, because a lot of our nations are small, is that if we sat and had a big production plan that we can see what it is we're using, what it is we're importing, and what are some of the things that we could start producing and therefore build out a supportive strategy to be able to set up a few facilities that have scale that's what you need, you need scale. Then if we had enough scale in say four items, we could negotiate differently with hotels who want to come here and say they must import everything duty free because of the cost, because you can't provide it. If we decided that the, the chocolates that sit on the bedside table could be made in, in, in the region, if we decided that the soaps and the lotions in, on the countertop could be made in the region, then we could build production capability around a number of things and say to those hotels that instead of giving you duty-free concessions to bring those things in, that once you buy from the region, they will try to match as close as possible the, 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 the price point that you're looking for and give you concessions in other areas. We've got to start and be able to do in, in, those types of things. In fairness, that's where we're going. And I don't want people to leave here believing that we haven't made steps because the regional private sector organization that is being established now to come to the table at CARICOM is being established with a view to being able to focus on four key areas. One, food security. Two, air and maritime transport. Three, ICT, the technology we just spoke about to create that single domestic space, and fourthly, renewable energy, which is obviously a sine qua non for our being able to survive between now and the future with the climate change upon us. So that work is being done. It's perhaps taken a little longer than we would like, but it allows us then to look at production integration. You have a country like Suriname and Guyana, who are outside of the hurricane belt and for whom agricultural production then is 52 weeks per year. Why are we not using them more efficiently to guarantee food security in the region? But we then need to master the transport and the logistics because that's really what is causing it to be perishable before it reaches us. So all of these things are beginning to come together, but the bottom line is you can meet twice a year to make these decisions. And Prime Minister, the bottom line is also you need to invest in your regional training institutions like the SRC, which have all of these, 
all of these items on their agenda, food security, e-commerce, renewable energy. So we're looking forward to the support of everybody here. Uh, I, think, I think that the principal is smiling because she knows that she's already been the recipient of a bounty. And it's about, in addition to that, to have the vesting of the Lazaretto lands as well in Cave Hill, <laughs> and to have the vesting of St. Joseph Hospital in a special purpose vehicle where they will hold, university will hold 70% of it. I think the principal is smiling because she was happy that we got a plug for the Sridhar Ranfal Center that with too. the Prime Minister on the stage and the Minister of Trade but, and the but, Ambassador. But, but, but I go further because yeah, the Sridhar Ranfal right Center is about to anchor. We have appointed Mr. Arthur who is a professor of practice on this campus, to lead the effort for us with respect to creating a paper to influence our perspective as small vulnerable economies going into UNCTAD, which we hope after next week and the vote, we will confirm that Barbados will host UNCTAD 15 here in October next year. But the Rampal Center, I'm told, Please clap. is also helping to buttress Mr. Arthur's work to feed yes. into that Congress. Excellent. I got that on record. Now, <laughs> I'm going to listen to the people. We, I, I don't want to trespass too heavily on people's time. We wanted to close by nine, but I would really like to entertain no more than two questions from the audience for this once in a lifetime panel of wonderful women shaping trade and economic governance in the region and internationally, please make your way to the mic, ask your questions short and sweet, please, because we don't have much time. Oh, my pr principal has said five questions, but make them short so that we can get through them quickly, please. Thank you. Hi, good night. My name is Ashley Andersard, and firstly, I'd just like to say it is truly an honor to be in the audience for such a panel discussion as a student of gender and Commonwealth Caribbean law and also international political economies. I am absolutely honored that you all are here, and especially um, Senora Gonzalez, especialmente el hecho que inglés no es primera, lengua primera, pero están aquí hablando temas que están de importancia de todo el mundo, especialmente en el Caribe. It is truly inspiring. So I have question. My question now is <laughs> the fact that you had meant you all had, um, had mentioned that the revised Treaty of Tragaramos is outdated. I am of the understanding that we still have not achieved all the objectives of the revised Treaty of Tragaramos. How can we, or how can I, as a student or any as an audience member, ensure that we do achieve the goals of the revised Treaty of Tragaramos and also integration? I'm going to leverage launch that one over first to the ambassador. Is there someone else who has a short, thank you so much. Obligada, that's the wrong language. Mer uh, gracias. <laughs> Muchisimas gracias. <laughs> ambassador, you can respond. I'm sure somebody else will want to. And whoever wants to ask the next question, please go to the mic quickly. Yes, ambassador. Uh, thank, thank you for the question. Um, but I'm not sure it's fair to say that anyone said that the revised treaty was outdated. Certainly, when I refer to the revised treaty in the context of the uh, commitment to establish a regional e-commerce um, regime, uh, I was actually commenting on the foresight of the drafters of the revised treaty in that in the, as I said, I think it was in the mid-1990s when the revised treaty was being finalized they actually saw fit to put in a requirement that we establish at some point um, a, 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 an e-commerce regime. Yes, there are elements of the treaty that may need to be reviewed, but I don't think that, collective, that we can make a general assessment that the treaty is outdated. I think the challenge is to implement all of the, 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 the provisions uh, of the treaty. Anyone else? Yes, please. Good night, ladies. Um, tonight, each speaker would have touched in their own way on the issue of the rise of nationalistic thought modalities or negative nationalistic thought modalities among global players um, in terms of Brexit and the rise of British nationalism, US and Trump's America First policies, uh, nationalistic parties rising throughout Europe. Um, 
in that framework, right, as we push towards the integration and the regional integration program and deepening that, I've always believed a good nationalist, a good nationalist is a good regionalist. We can only truly get what we need for ourselves if we look out for us as a group. So in terms of that, how do you suggest we combat negative thought modalities within our population? As you know, when a general population pushes for something is when generally the political will manifests to carry us all the way through to completion. So what would you think in terms of, what are your suggestions for creating that positive regionalist mindset within our general populations? Does anybody want to take that? You just have to talk to your people and talk truth. I, I don't know what else to say. You know, we went through a false conversation causing people to believe that we could do everything within Barbados and in fact, I cause it, call it perhaps the worst part of our history when we told people ever so welcome, wait for a call. And, and the irony is that the same people who we wanted to put on a bench are now the people who perhaps will grow the greatest rate, uh, have the greatest rate of economic growth for the next few years, not just in the region, but globally. That's karma. <laughs> That's a form of political karma. So. I think that we just have to talk to people today. I said it again, when a country reaches 53 years old, as we are about to reach, if you can have mature conversations as a nation, when you gonna have them? And the bottom line is that we need to be able to rely on each other in the same way that Arantxa made the point that the global community, no, multi, no superpower can do it, no two, three countries can fight back climate change, you need international cooperation, you need regional cooperation, you need successful neighborhoods. And we have to tell people that in the same way that if you lived in a community and your children were not talking to anybody else in the community, you would have to say to them that you can't live so with people and that this is not how you are expected to live and to rely on each other to get through life. I think we'll take the last question. Okay, thank from you. Nicole. Um, so, Prime Minister, my question is directed primarily towards you, but I welcome any other comments. And um, it relates, I want to pick up on two themes. So, the importance of the people and, and change coming from sort of from the bottom up, and the importance of imp in information in that context. And my concern is um, the lack of access that CARICOM nationals have to what happens when our heads meet, the decisions that our heads make in the context of, of so in the Myri case, the CCJ has said, heads decisions create obligations and create rights in respect of those nationals. But if those decisions aren't published, if they aren't accessible readily to us, I mean, to this day, I, I still can't get an actual copy of the decision of the, the extending the, the six month stay. And so my question is, you know, what, what thought is being given to the the systems to be put in place to allow our citizens, the ordinary man on the street, to know what these rights are, to know and to hold our governments to account, to make sure that it's not just a talk show. I don't know that you want me to speak. I might get myself in trouble. <laughs> I, look, last year I said, and I maintain it, and the truth is I will take up chairmanship of CARICOM in January. I hope that in that period of time, in the six months, I can influence how business is done. I feel strongly that the open sessions of CARICOM should be streamed live in the same way that you can listen to the Parliament of Barbados live or the Parliament of Jamaica live or the Parliament of Trinidad and Tobago. I accept that matters pertaining to caucus should remain in caucus. But we speak about a number of things that really if we were to stream them to our population and they began to understand the issues that we were considering and the things that we were reflecting on, there would be far more consideration and far more appreciation for where we are going. So I hope, my dear, that, and I'm not sure that it is accurate to say that you can't get the decisions, they may take long to come, but I think the decisions are there. Gail, you can confirm that for me. But we need real-time interest because very few people in this university or in our population are interested in historic decisions unless it is for research purposes. People want to know what you're deciding today, today. 
And regrettably, that is the world in which we live. And, and just to add, um, a decision has been taken by heads that their decisions will be published. Um, and they should be published, um, meaning that it should be happening now. But I, I will accept that uh, certainly we have one of the things that CARICOM has to address is the way in which we communicate with the Caribbean public. We have really got to find uh, uh, more effective platforms of doing so. But the decision to, to make public the decisions of heads of government has been taken. And as far as I'm aware, those that will be, because as Prime Minister mentioned, there are issues they discuss in caucus, those decisions may not necessarily be published, but the other decisions, particularly those affecting rights, um, uh, are to be published and should be available, certainly the last few heads on the CARICOM website. Can I, uh, can I just uh, a short comment on this? Um, because this is one of the central themes of the book, is the theme of trust. And you need to build trust. And if you don't want this ugly face of nationalism, or if you don't like the ugly faces of populism, uh, because not all nationalism is bad, not all populism is bad, not all regular, but if you want the ugly faces to disappear, you have to generate trust. And generating trust requires today that we change the way we govern. In the 19th century, in the 20th century, it was top down. It was governments. In the 21st century, as we are seeing with the fight on climate change, it's not just governments. It's not just top down. It's, 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 a, it's a form of poly governance where you've got many more actors, where for sure it's much more difficult to get to consensus because you need to mobilize and convince, but where the essential theme is trust. And trust can only be built with a bit more transparency. Uh, is the lesson that uh, the trade negotiators have learned the hard way. If you just, just do all your trade negotiations behind closed doors and one day you announce the deal, the likelihood that is going to be accepted and acceptable is pretty low. So you've got to, you have to have spaces for discrete conversations, but you have to build trust. And trust comes from transparency. So read the book. Maybe you find a few answers in there. It's uh, freely downloadable on the internet, of course. I think I'm going to take one more question from um, Linda, <laughs> very quickly, and then we're going to we're going to wrap it all up. Prime Minister, why can't we legalize? Mar I knew you weren't going to ask oh. the other question, so I figured it was marijuana. Look, we, we, we made a decision as a government that we are going to go to the people. You can't go to the people when it suits you and not go to the people when you don't want to go to them. And I keep making the point that principles only mean something when it is inconvenient to stand by them. The truth is that I've heard all of the political parties support it as a platform. But our view is that when it comes to wedge issues, issues that are not critical to the role of government, but more to governance, we need to go to the people. And the technology allows us to do it more efficiently and effectively. For us at this stage, we believe that it is more important for us to start with medical cannabis. We've sent it to a select committee. We've heard in the select committee the evidence given by the doctors, the evidence from the Rastafarian community who believe, like in St. Vincent, that it is sacrament, and we are conscious that up to last week in Kenya, the courts ruled that Rastafarians are a valid religious sect in its own right that deserve their own respect. So we're hearing all of that, and we're going to make the decisions, but we know that when it comes to recreational cannabis, we're gonna to come to the people we're going to let everybody's view contend, and we're going to make a decision as a population. So let us get there one step at a time. First, medical cannabis. We're going to get that hopefully out of the way within another couple of weeks, and then we're going to start the conversation. And why? Because at the end of the day, 
53 years old as a country, we got to start talking. You can't have a conversation about legalizing cannabis without talking about the implications for young people smoking too early and the implications for public health of that happening. We don't want our young people, our athletes, because, and you need to talk to your children. You need to be able to say that you might smoke in a family and your sister or brother might smoke and it's two different reactions. But the bottom line is that these are things that adults might want to do, but you can't have people who are in the process of still developing being exposed to the same public health risk. Um, now, similarly, young people aren't supposed to drink alcohol, but alcohol is still legal. So that doesn't mean that it becomes illegal because you have that conversation, but you have to have the conversation. And when I go into communities and I see youngsters who are good athletes and I say to them and I see them going at 16 years old, want to drink a brand, they say, what are you doing? And I don't talk to them anymore. I talk to the people around them. You think that if Usain Bolt was drinking brandy or smoking herb as an athlete, he would be Usain Bolt today as the best sprinter the world has ever seen? And that if we don't nurture and take care of our young people when we see them doing things and when we see them with the potential, then that is the kind of madness that happens. So I want us to have some conversations as a people and it's not simply about ticking boxes for political popularity, but it is literally about shaping this nation and getting it back on its feet to play the role that we can play to produce global citizens because we can't shut our boundaries, but to ensure that as we produce global citizens, they're anchored by Bajan values and Bajan roots. So, so we're going to end on that very high note. <laughs> can I say one other thing, though, because I just want to Please. really salute Arancha. For those of you who don't know, Arancha Gonzalez is a friend of the Caribbean, but she's also definitively a friend of Barbados. <laughs> and, and, and I say so without fear of any form of contradiction. Um, it helps that also her chief of staff is a Barbadian, but that's not the reason why. Um, and we salute Matthew, as, as don't mind, he's not on this platform, but he is an integral part of the equation. But I also want to say that last year, and around when Sandra was answering the question about SMEs, she was very modest and didn't tell you about the excellent work that they're doing with the coconut industry in the region that the ITC, International Trade Center, is doing. But more importantly for me and this government that I lead, that within the first two months of us being a government and with very much a new cabinet, Arantxa left Europe and came to Barbados to engage with my cabinet to begin to ensure that they understood that we are not going to solidify the gains of independence. We're not going to transform our nation by closing inwards, but we need to prepare ourselves to engage the world and engage the world fairly on a set of rules and precepts that are known to all. And in fairness, Nani, Ambassador Mathurin came with a rancher to do the presentation with Matthew to cabinet because cabinet is not omnipotent, omniscient, or any of those things. And we are learning and we are ensuring that the information that's necessary for us to learn will help inform the kind of decisions to improve our development options and our success. And Arancha, thank you very much for being a friend of our country and our region. Well, not much more for me to do other than to thank the panelists, um, wonderful shapers of international and regional economic governance. Um, very grateful that you agreed to spend so much of your time with us and share your thoughts on a whole slew of topics. I could not have orchestrated it better even if I wanted to. We, we learned about leading and listening we learned about the importance of superheroines. We learned about the importance of women and the $4 trillion worth of, of value they contribute. We learned about the importance of trust. 
We learned about the importance of good training, and I have some students from the SRC here, and I'm glad past and present that they're here to learn from at the feet of these wonderful women. So I don't want to stay any longer on this um, platform. I would like to invite Matthew, who is our co-collaborator in this venture, to give the official vote of thanks. But let me just thank you, ladies, so much for being on this panel. Thank you, and wonderful audience. I feel like I should, I should bow down to this panel as I walked onto this porch. So thank you very much, Janeve. So in 1997, Professor Barto, then the director of the Center for Gender and Development Studies at UE, you delivered the inaugural lecture of the Dame Nita Barrow Women in Development and Community Transformation Divisionship. The title of that address was, Are Caribbean Women Taking Over? Are Caribbean Women Taking Over? What do you think? I... So, more than 30 years later to have you, now the Pro Vice Chancellor and Principal of UE Cave Hill, open a dialogue with Barbados's first woman Prime Minister, with the woman head of a United Nations body, with the woman Minister for Trade in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Foreign Trade, and with the woman director general at the regional office of trade negotiations, I think it really does answer that question. You have four people on this stage who are at the absolute top of their game. They have at least three things in common. They're all passionate about the importance of multilateralism and the power of trade for growth and development. They're all advocates for addressing the specific issues of small, vulnerable economies. And they're all fierce advocates for investing in women's economic empowerment. But I have a fourth thing in common, that's me. Um, I've, you know, that's the truth. I've had the absolute pleasure, the privilege to work with all of them at various points in my career. So Neil and I, you know, you and I are just footnotes tonight. Uh, we're helping you, the audience, to manage the absolutely incredible shine coming off this stage of exemplary leaders who simply just happen to be women. Tonight, however, was not just about getting a woman's perspective on this tumultuous dramedy that we call geopolitics. It was about hearing the best in their field give us an insight into some of the ways we can help fix a world gone off the rails. Every member of this panel has been in the global trade and economic trenches. They have seen history, they have made history, and they will continue to shape history. So I want to thank the government of Barbados and the University of the West Indies, specifically the SRC, for responding so passionately to this opportunity to showcase this publication, Women Shaping Global Economic Governance. So I suspect that, like me, when many of you leave this room tonight, you will still be, and I'm using a phrase from Dean Bailey, another exceptional woman leader. You'll be tingling with excitement from tonight's experience. A few days or weeks later, you will find that some of what you've heard tonight will creep into your thoughts, the way you work, the way you live, the way you think, and you'll question and you'll form your own views, maybe come up with something different. But years from now, you, especially the students in this room, will remember this occasion that we all had to listen and learn from the very best the world has to offer in politics, economics, law, and trade. It gives me great pride that three-fourths of these women are from the Caribbean, and that the other quarter is Caribbean at heart and in spirit. And I promise you, I will give her some rum before she leaves. <laughs> so thank you all very much for being here tonight. And please, please keep this important conversation going. Thank you.